Assalamu alaikum and good evening to you. Now since the oration is about uh, ICT policy, specifically on education, I thought it's uh, nice to have a look at what is happening right now in Sri Lanka with IT. So this is a video clip that I just played here to show you where we stand today. So we are in a very good stand right now, yes. But there are a few things that we need to work on. So when principal sir told me that why don't you do a oration on this subject, I thought okay maybe I will gather everything from my life, the last maybe 20-30 years where I was involved in ICT, education, business, traveling. I thought okay maybe this is a good chance to talk a little bit about that. So we have assembled here today to commemorate the 131st anniversary of the establishment of Zaire College. Our beloved alma mater and delivering this Founders Day oration for this prestigious institution of such a significant milestone is an extraordinary honor. Allow me to express my heartfelt gratitude to several key figures who have made this occasion possible. I extend my sincere thanks to Mr. Trizy Marikar, our esteemed principal, Mr. Fauzul Amin, the chairman of the board of governors and the dedicated members of the board. Also, the vice principals, Mr. Mira, and many others who have extended this invitation to me. In 1976, I embarked on my educational journey at Zaire College. That's when I joined the grade one. It marked the beginning of my academic life as a first grade student. The era was characterized by global landscape in constant flux. That was a very interesting period. There were pivotal events shaping the course of history at that time. The world grappled with significant changes, including the aftermath of oil crisis in 1973, the conclusion of the Vietnam War in 75, and the Iranian Revolution in 79, and also the remarkable Apollo moon landing. But amidst all these global transformations, our homeland, Sri Lanka, was also navigating a path of evolution and adaptation. We were still in the process of recovering from the aftermath of the unfortunate single only movement. A period marked by tragic assassination of the Prime Minister, our domestic policies emphasized import substitution at that time and a shift toward an agriculture based economy. Yes, we tried that. Additionally, this period witnessed the nationalization of key industries as our nation sought to redefine its economic and industrial identity. At Zaira College, the education landscape underwent a significant transformation as well. The institution transitioned away from English as the medium of instru instruction, leaving only Tamil and Singhala as available options. And here I am, trying to join Zaira College in 1976. Despite strong opposition from our extended family, if you remember at that time, usually the Muslims spoke Tamil in Sri Lanka. So my father and mother had to go through a lot of trouble explaining my immediate family members why my father wanted me to join single medium at Zaira College. So my courageous parents made the decision to enroll me in the single medium class. While the majority of Muslim students were pursuing their studies in Arabic or Tamil, our cohort forged ahead in the single medium. But we were very, very lucky at that time. We were privileged to receive education from some of the most esteemed educators in the country at Zaira College, who were dedicated to imparting knowledge in the Sinhala language, history, art, and also literature. I'll tell you why it was very important in a minute. So, recollecting our exceptional single language instructors remain etched in my memory, in my heart. Among them, the late Mrs. Gunasekara, Mrs. Silva, Mr. Amaradasa, Mr. Abe Kohn, Mr. Amarasekara, Mr. Chandrana Otunna, Mr. Tangal, Mrs. Lienage, and also Mrs. Rupa Singer stand out as luminaries in our educational journey. I speak I would say it's a good Sinhala, thanks to my teachers at Zaira College. Zahira also held the distinction of pioneering vocational education on the island. 
we were fortunate to have access to one of the best equipped workshop at that era, offering diverse ranges of subjects to, to choose from, including radio electronics, metalworks, woodwork, weaving, motor mechanics, and also printing. In my case, I opted for carpentry at that time, woodworking. I was introduced to the senior library during my grade eight. I was an avid reader. I, I read a lot and I read a lot thanks to my mother, that was. Due to the interest created within me during the singular literature classes, I started enjoying all the novels at this great library at the college. But once they were done, I've read pretty much all the novels out there, so what do I do now? I started focusing on the glossy science magazines, graciously donated by our benefactors from around the world. We had some of the best, latest science magazine and period periodicals at the college at that time. And that's when I developed a fascination towards science, specifically for physics and chemistry. This is in the 80s. I was mesmerized by the development of electronics and computers. The librarian at that time, Marhum Emile Farooq, never said no to me whenever I wanted to access the reference sections. Reference section is like a very religious place. People don't go there. Only, only the special people can go there. So I was one of those special people who had access to the reference section any time of the day. So that's where we, I spent most of my afternoons. So although my PT subjects was woodworking, during my O-level time, I started visiting the electronic workshop and spent the time with Mr. Zufa, the young, kind-hearted teacher who answered all my questions even when I was at my annoying best. I asked all kinds of questions. Why this? Why that? If I want to do this, how do I do this? All kinds of questions. So he was very kind enough to explain all my questions. So that led me to join his private classes after O-levels in 1986 to learn analog electronics. At that time, computers were not there, not existent almost at that time, for at least the general public. I joined his private class and did my first tertiary diploma. This was operating on the first floor of the famous Soma tea room close by, next to the tower hall. Now I remember one evening, Mr. Zufa was meddling with a small black box with a tiny keypad. I was very curious to see what is going on here. So all we did was, you know, learning how to repair radios and television. And here we have a, another special gadget we've been meddling with. So it was hooked onto a TV and a cassette player at that time. I was instantly attracted to it. So we spent many nights trying to master this new toy. I later known, came to know that it was something called a Sinclair ZX81, a computer with just one kilobyte of memory. One kilobyte of memory, yes. So there was a language called BASIC. We were trying to write all kinds of code on that gadget. I was getting very late going home and uh, doing all kinds of crazy things like I'm reading and thinking and writing. So my mother noticed this. So my strange behavior, she realized I have an obsession with computers. So to make me happy, she spent a fortune at that time to buy me a state-of-the-art computer at that time, a Sinclair Spectrum, it was called. It was a color computer, uh, faster and has more things and I was in cloud nine. I was very, very happy. And when I use that computer, no one can watch the TV or play any music because I wanted, I, I hook, hook it up to a television and I need the cassette player to uh, record my code and also read my code. So I had full access to my TV and the cassette record at home. But coming back to 1989, the Sri Lanka was again going through a lot of trouble. We had two civil wars, one in the north, one in the south. And that's when I was finishing my A-levels and the country was not helpful at all. People at my age were dying, getting killed every day. So I left the country to reach Sarja in the UAE. And I was there for about four years, doing all kinds of interesting things. I was exposed to the world of advanced computers, the business you can do with it, programming, design, lots of different things. I was about 22 years old at that time. And that was a major challenge for me and an excellent exposure in my life. So when I came back to Sri Lanka, I think around 2003, I was introduced to this wonderful group called 
group of 80. By two of my friends, Ashraf Zohair, and also my classmate, Amir Majid. And what the first thing I did was to come back to the college around that time to see, okay, what is going on at Zaira College? I was thrilled to discover that Zahira had commenced her IT learning journey as early as 1995. As part of another visionary initiated by Professor Furkan, not just computers, we also had English medium education at Zaira College, something that many other schools didn't have in the early 90s. Ever since then, we've been dedicating to impart IT knowledge to the young Zahirians from a very, very early days. When the ICT subject was introduced to A-level students, we were among the first to embrace it when the government decided to offer A-level as another stream, another subject. We were one of the first to embrace it. What's even more remarkable is that our students have consistently achieved a 100% pass rate. Now, that's fantastic, right? Since 2014. Now, some people think learning IT or ICT, to be exact, is to, you know, you learn that you become computer programmers. Not necessarily. ICT is not that. When you learn IT, your other subjects also become very good. You learn maths, you learn science, you learn languages, you learn a lot of other things as well. In fact, you learn how to learn with IT. So you don't need to go to the class, you don't need to listen to a teacher, you can perhaps open an article online, you can watch a YouTube video that will te teach you something within a few minutes rather than listening to someone for 30 minutes. So it's a, it's a door that opens you to many other things to learn. In fact, the, this is evident when observing the advanced level pass rates. Now look at the numbers which increase significantly from 58% in 2013 to almost 80% last year, 2022. So that is a result of Zahira's role in educating and giving IT education to the rest of the students here. Now I'm saying all this because there's a reason why. Right? Because it set the backdrop of my main topic, the necessity for a robust ICT education policy. Now, it is very pertinent because we are enjoying the Founders' Day here. Now, Zaira has been a pioneer, living up to its motto, as per Maroom A.M.A. Aziz said, radiating center of Muslim thought and activity. That is Zaira College. Also gave leadership to many such events in the past. Our founding fathers were visionaries. In 1907, Marhum Wapichi Marikar said, and I quote him, we aim at making our boys fill high and responsible positions in life. In 1909, Marhum Ayalem Abdulaziz said, for the survival of the community, it was necessary that a fair number of Zahirians should possess, actually a fair number of Muslims in the country should possess good knowledge of English which is indispensable to commercial prosperity, good citizenship, and seeking professional knowledge. Now, these are said by early 90s. And if you notice, most of the Muslims at that time were focusing on business, not education. So, in the world of complex IT industry, I want to talk about something very important here. Now, we are talking about the IT and the education. So I thought, let me um, bring some light to what is happening around us, around the world and also close to uh, our country, India. Company type, called the unicorn company type. Right? So a unicorn is a privately held startup company with a valuation of $1 billion. A company to have a valuation of $1 billion is a big deal. People who started companies know how difficult it is. We are talking dollars here, one billion dollars. So unicorn companies are typically innovative or disruptive companies that are expected to grow quickly. There are an estimated 
1,100 unicorns around the world. According to Central Bank Insights, with a cumulative valuation of $3.6 billion or an average of $3.3 billion per unicorn. So if you look at the average, we are talking about $3 billion for one company. And if you look at 2022, last year, the top global unicorn companies were Uber, Airbnb, Palantir, Snapchat, SpaceX, Pinterest, Xiaomi, Didi Quadi, China Internet Plus, and also Flipkart. Out of these 10, we can see six are from the US, America, and two, actually three from China and one from India. But looking back at our neighbor, India, in 2021, I saw a mind-boggling 42 startup turns into unicorns. So if you look at 2018, there were eight, 2019 there were 10, 2020 there were 10, but in 2021 there were 42 startups valued at $1 billion. So to put it in perspective, this is more than the total of the previous three years combined. In fact, at 42 unicorns, India even edged past the UK, United Kingdom, as the third largest ecosystem with the most number of unicorns. The US leads the world with the most number of unicorns, followed by China, as per the Hurun Global Unicorn Index in 21, and Bengaluru, a city close to us, <coughs> has emerged as the seventh biggest unicorn hub in, in the world. Data from Deloitte Capital shows that Indian fintech companies, those are financial technology companies, raised 10 billion, 10 billion dollars in 2021, compared to just 4 billion in 2019, and 3 billion in 2020. Most of this is thanks to the reverse brain drain happening in India. Now what is that? Now we see today, a lot of Sri Lankans are leaving the country. It is the reverse that is happening in India. Many Indians are coming back to India. And with them they bring their knowledge, their exposure, and of course their finances. So the key word here is ecosystem. What is ecosystem? Now why are we talking about what is happening outside Sri Lanka? Well, let's look at the Sri Lanka's economy. So as of September 2021, our GDP was about 81 billion US dollars. The whole country, by the way, is 81 US dollars, billion US dollars. So of which that, 60% coming from the services. So let's forget the rest of that. So the 60% is broken down into 25% of wholesale and retail, transport, tourism, and financial sectors. Now, the IT sector is not highlighted here, but it is embedded in one of these numbers inside. So, SLASCOM, the apex body of Sri Lanka when it comes to IT, and we call it the BPM sector. I ran a video here to show you where we stand as far as Sri Lanka is concerned. So, we are an emerging global destination of choice for knowledge solutions. Sri Lanka is ranked among the top 15 global outsourcing destinations. We are also among top 20 emerging cities. Sri Lanka also won the Outsourcing Destination of the Year accolade awarded by the National Outsourcing Association UK successfully in 2013 and also 14. And our knowledge services industry is the fifth largest export earner for Sri Lanka in 2018 and is currently estimated to be 1.2 billion US dollars with over 80,000 employees engaged in the industry. The knowledge solution industry has been identified as a trust industry by the government within the national export strategy. So look at this, we are targeting a 5 billion dollar worth of export, 200,000 jobs with 1,000 startups, whereas India is already making startups with about 40 billion dollars. So do you see the difference here? While we are struggling to reach a 5 billion goal, our neighbor, our big brother, our nana, we say, is raising more than 10 billion a year, just from the new startups. We are not talking about the established large corporations in India. This is just the startup companies. So my questions are, what is the lesson here? What can we do as a country, at least how do we even align ourselves to this massive opportunity in the ICT sector? 
Let me share a famous quote from James Plummer, the former Stanford Dean, made in 2017 at the IEEE summit. He said, the engineers of the future will not resemble the engineers of the past. Now this is very important because a lot of people are very worried about AI and whether they are taking the jobs. Says that the engineers of the future will not resemble the engineers of the past. They will have to be able to do what machines of the future can not do. So like I was saying, there's a lot of talk about nowadays about AI, you know, artificial intelligence taking away jobs and how are we going to teach something because there's computers already. Uh, how are we going to mark assessment because students can, you know, easily copy. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. The future, of course, there's a big role in AI there, yes, but nothing much to worry about. Now, in 2018, the World Economic Forum released its Future of Jobs report. And there were some highlights about 133 million new job roles coming up. So new jobs are coming up compared with a declining of 73 million jobs. So 133 million coming, 75 million going. So we still have new jobs coming up into the market. So data analyst, machine learning, operation management, sales and marketing, skills development role are in the emerging list while clerks, bookkeeping, factory work, or secretarial roles are declining. So remember, I told you about a word called ecosystem, right? So that must be our target in Sri Lanka. So let me rephrase my question. How can we create an ecosystem that can innovate so much that it would attract new growth capital? Well. We don't have a simple answer, and India has few distinct advantages that we don't have currently. So, massive population compared to 20 million, 1 billion in India. And also compared to brain drain happening here versus reverse brain drain happening in India. And another very important something happening in India is the high penetration of digital currency. So there are a lot of innovation happened because of this reason, digital currency. So let me elaborate a few topics here. Number one, the global digital revolution. So the world is currently in the midst of a profound digital transformation. And Sri Lanka cannot afford to lag behind. Now this is an area of global growth. So many nations have effectively harnessed the potential of technology that are witnessing the substantial advantages in the form of economic expansion, elevated living standards, increased global prominence. It is imperative that we shift our focus beyond the confines of the agricultural revolution in Sri Lanka, or agricultural economy in Sri Lanka. And also enhancing education. So one compelling reason for the necessity of a national ICT policy is to revolutionize our education system. Information and communication technology can fundamentally change how students engage with learning, making it more interactive, engaging, and also accessible. The recent experience of COVID-19 pandemic vividly illustrates the power of ICT. I'm sure all of you have experienced it in the last few years. During the pandemic, our children had no choice but to transition to online learning. This sudden shift awakened the entire nation to the possibilities of smart devices and remote education. It also underscored the consequences of lacking a consistent policy in this regard. There were no policy, there were no guidelines. We were just thrown to the deep end to get going and nobody knew what to do. Interestingly, the tuition industry swiftly embraced remote learning more effectively than many schools. Across the country, you can find numerous tutors offering online lectures now. But the pandemic is over now. We are back to the usual uh, learning. But then all the effort that we were doing during the pandemic time in the school system is not going on now as much as we used to do before. So why don't we apply a similar approach to our formal school systems? We could enable proficient teachers to collaborate on the learning experience through online platforms. Now, China has done it very successfully. 
And in fact, at Zahira, you know, because I was personally involved during that time, we were also very successfully running such systems. Luckily, we had the software long before the pandemic. We had a learning management system. We had a education score tracking system. So everything was in place. So it was pretty simple for us to get on board. Only thing is, there were so many different software systems available. So we were uh, not sure as to which one will serve our need best. And also empowering the workforce. So job market is evolving rapidly with many traditional jobs being replaced by automation and technology. To remain competitive, our workforce must be equipped with digital skills. So a policy of this regard will adequately train for the jobs of the future, reducing unemployment and also underemployment while boosting economic growth. I must also mention here the role of the AI in workplace, the artificial intelligence. A lot of people are worried, like I said earlier. The media is full of articles about how AI is going to replace many jobs. Yes, it can and it will. But the future is for people who know how to use AI for their advantage. AI can and will replace you if you do not know how to harness the power of AI for your advantage. Now that's the lesson we need to take from AI. And also bridging the urban-rural divide. So in Sri Lanka, urban areas have better access to ICT resources. It was very well witnessed during even the COVID uh, time. You notice you may have seen news reports where the students had to climb trees to get some uh, mobile coverage to connect with their teachers for online learning. Now to address this issue, a thoughtfully crafted policy can narrow this gap ensuring that every citizen, regardless of where they live, can access high-quality ICT education and infrastructure. It's worth noting that in comparison to several neighboring countries, Sri Lanka boasts a reasonably extensive coverage of 4G. There were a few pockets here and there, but we are all right. Our cost is also very comparable compared to some of the other countries in the region. And then fostering innovation. Innovation plays a pivotal role in driving economic growth. By nurturing ICT education and research, we can cultivate a vibrant ecosystem of innovation and entrepreneurship in Sri Lanka. This in turn has the potential to catalyze the creation of indigenous technology solution and draw foreign investments. Abundant open source projects offer valuable learning opportunities. I think uh, the video you notice on a distinct note of pride, our coders have achieved a remarkable feat by securing consecutive victorious in the Google Summer of Code. Now, that's a global competition managed by Google. We've been winning the places for the 10 years continuously, our coders in Sri Lanka. So, even the e-governance and citizen services can be enhanced through ICT education policy. So, how can we improve the government services? It can streamline the bureaucratic procedures, diminish corruption, and elevate the overall caliber of the government services. It empowers citizens to conveniently access crucial services online, resulting in time and cost savings. I'm sure you may have experienced, the adults may have experienced this already. So, in Sri Lanka, we already enjoy vehicle revenue licensing, passport photos, where you go to a studio, you take the photograph, it is digitally transmitted to the immigration department for processing. Exam results, that I'm sure our uh, Zahirians are already enjoying getting the results online. The QR full passes we've been enjoying for the past few months. The demand for expanding such services remains substantial. There's a lot of demand, a lot of opportunities out there in that regard. Also, if you look at the global competitiveness of Sri Lanka, ICT, gives us a fantastic opportunity. So our neighboring countries have already recognized the importance of ICT education and have made substantial investment in this area. So to remain competitive in the global market, we must do the same. So the policy will not only align us with our forward-thinking neighbors, but also empower our citizens with the skills and knowledge required to thrive in the digital age. So we will be well prepared to meet the challenges and opportunities of the evolving global market space. We are already doing that. Many top Sri Lankan companies are operating and you know, getting staff from other neighboring countries like India, for example. 
and also another major area is cyber security now with increased reliance on ICT the need for robust cyber security measures is also very paramount a well crafted policy can include provisions for cyber security education and training helping protect our nation from cyber threats now this is also becoming a seriously uh, important aspect around the world next one is environmental sustainability so the policy can also address this area especially on the smart resource management reduce energy consumption and also support eco friendly practices so a national policy can adapt and sustain these technologies now uh, we can see this already happening in the introduction of smart hybrid power inverters if you remember the power crisis we faced many companies and homes converted their energy system into solar based battery bank systems and i think the country or the government has done a wonderful job of exempting taxes on these such devices so the batteries solar panels are exempted from taxes so that's a very good uh, area in fact many it companies also give loans and discounts for such systems to install at home so we can have a continuous power in the ict area and another very very important aspect here is to address the building digital literacy now we are boasting about having the best literacy in the region so we boast about you know having more than 90% literacy but it literacy is another matter that's very very important why it is an essential skill in the modern age serving as a cornerstone of effective participation in totally digitally driven world now if you look at uh, like for example banking the number of people who are having a credit card is very still very slow due to lots of different reasons so if you have a card you can do digital transactions now people are still believing in hard cash now it's one thing india got away with when modi wanted to change cash rather hard currency overnight to digital currency now that gave a major boost people thought it is impossible now you walk into a uh, any shop even a street side shop you can pay from your mobile phone and they accept it and the policy is very very important for education because these programs empower our people with knowledge and tools necessary for navigate the digital terrain this becomes increasingly vital as we witness a surge in incidents where our citizen fall victim to scams and ransomware attacks so some people might think okay sri lanka we are a you know developing country we are protected with these cyber attacks not really every day you see somebody coming up with some jargon like uh, cryptocurrency or blockchain and they say okay invest your money here we we use cryptocurrency and people go at a rate and they invest their hard earned money there and very soon they realize it's just a buzzword but they are a typical scammers every year you see at least two or three that is because their digital knowledge is very low and they don't know what is going around the world so this digital literacy awareness and preparedness is very very important now let me also talk about the challenges we may face because of this so for us to move forward we must do the following in fact there are a couple of things we need to look at budget constraints infrastructure development curriculum design all those things we need to look into however with the concerted effort from the government the invaluable support from the private sector and the civil society we can overcome these challenges so to move forward here are some of the things we can do allocate sufficient financial resources to develop ict infrastructure and train educators training the teachers very very important collaborate with the private sector to leverage their expertise and resources and then develop a comprehensive curriculum that integrate ICT seamlessly to our education system remember i said ICT is not making computer programmers no ICT is a learning thing it's a skill like english it is a skill that we need to master with ICT you learn how to learn and also prioritize digital literacy programs for all citizens and establish a monitoring and evaluation mechanism to track the progress and make the necessary adjustments 
So a properly developed and empowered policy will contribute to the knowledge economy. It will help research-based business startups. It will also help development of the learning society. As per UNESCO, education is key to development. So UNESCO says education is key to development. I think we are witnessing it today about what is the role of education and the havoc it has created in our own country. At the, at the same time, I want to highlight the commendable effort of the Ministry of Education, particularly through initiatives like e Taksalava, the National Institute of Education, NIE, which plays a crucial role in curriculum development and providing valuable educational resources, and also the Open University with their facilities for remote education. With all that, it is essential to recognize that their current contribution to modernizing the education system with information and communication technology remains somewhat limited. This is where collaboration with the private sector becomes imperative. Initiatives undertaken by the Sri Lanka Rupawaini Corporation and DP Education serves as exemplary models on how online education can be effectively disseminated to a wide audience, making quality learning accessible to the masses. I'm also seeing many other alternative education efforts are coming up now. One in uh, Trincomali, another one in Matara, few in Kalambu district, some in the Gampaha, Panadura. I see many uh, people, many entrepreneurs challenging and coming up with some fantastic ways of teaching. And ICT was a big role in that. I think it's good time now to everyone to come forward to look at how we can make it as a policy so that things will have a certain concerted effort towards a national action. So in conclusion, the imperative for a comprehensive national ICT education policy in Sri Lanka cannot be overstated. Such a policy represents a strategic investment in our nation's future. One that will empower our citizens, drive economic growth and position Sri Lanka as a global leader in our digital age. So let us unite and work together towards a brighter and more technologically advanced future for Sri Lanka, ensuring that no one is left behind in the digital revolution. We are doing that for the education revolution, but I think it's now time to do the same thing for the digital revolution. So your attention and support in this endeavors are greatly appreciated. So to conclude now, a verse from Quran that emphasized the importance of seeking knowledge. You know, Islam has a lot, a lot of focus on education. We hear saying, for education, go from Saudi Arabia to China. That's like, you know, it, it takes years at that time. Okay, now you can get to a plane and go. But imagine saying this about 1500 years ago. Go from Saudi Arabia to China if you need to learn something. So, that is a sort of emphasis Islam has put on us. It says, are those who knew equal to those who do not know? Only those of understanding will remember. Surah Al-Zumar. Al so this verse highlights the significance of knowledge and understanding, implying that those who seek knowledge are distinguished from those who do not. It encourages the pursuit of knowledge as a means of gaining understanding and wisdom to use their knowledge to benefit themselves and others. So my objective today is to give you an highlight of what is happening around the world and specifically what is happening in India, our neighbor, and also what we have been doing so far in Sri Lanka and also together how we can bring in some consistency to ICT as a policy and then take that as a moving forward mechanism to come out of the place we are in now, Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.